All right, let's talk about the harness connectors on this side of the engine. Um, the top one up here, this is the VVT oil control valve. This controls the timing gear. Uh, that's one connector. This one here, let's see, I'm pretty sure that that one is for the AC compressor. This one here is for that engine bay cooling fan that I told you about. You're gonna look all, all over this side of the engine for something to plug this into. You're not gonna find it. It's in the engine bay. Then the uh, last one is the oil pressure sender. Regarding the oil pressure sender, the oil gauge in an MR2 is a gauge. Uh, where all the cars with a silver top engine originally had a dummy light. So the oil, oil pressure sender in there is just an on off switch where this one is actually a gauge. Uh, if you want your gauge to work right, you want to move this sender over from your original 16 valve MR2 engine. Connections over on this side of the engine. Um, you of course have your injector connectors four across here. This whole plastic shield uh, to all the injector wiring is included in the harness. Uh, you've got your throttle position sensor connector and then you get into, there's two connectors on the alternator. You got that guy and that guy. All right over here on the intake side of the engine there's only two connectors. They are pretty easy to get to if you take this off. Uh, this does come off pretty easily. There's no reason not to take this off. One of them is the knock sensor. The knock sensor is right there. And there's a connector that goes to it right there. This wire here goes to it. The other one, I forget what device this is, but there's a connector right there. It is actually even more difficult to get off than the knock sensor um, if this thing's in the way. Just get it out of the way. You'll be done quick. Uh, I'm just going to plug some of these in as we go. This looks like a water temperature sensor. This one is the distributor. This one is a ground. It looks like it needs to bolt down right there. There is another water sensor of some sort down here. I don't know if it's a temperature sensor or what. Um, that's all off of that little pigtail. There's this little tricky guy I mentioned looking in the engine bay. Um, this connector is going to confuse you a little bit because it looks like it should connect to this. This is your reverse backup. The connector for this is in the chassis already. It's in the engine bay. Uh, the one that comes off the harness is for this engine bay temperature sensor. Uh, need to find a good place to locate this. I haven't done it yet. These are your uh, uh, coil and igniter. At the moment I'm a little mystified by this guy right here. Another sensor I don't see a connector on the harness immediately available. I was wondering what this guy was. As you can see down there, it's gone. Uh, that is the front wheel drive radiator temperature housing, or radiator temperature sensor. Uh, there's a different temperature sensor up at the front of the car. So this one is safe to delete and cap it off, or you can just use it as a cap, but basically you're not gonna need it. All right, uh, continuing on in the wiring harness, you've got this connector. This is a chassis harness connector. This connects uh, right below the fuse box, the engine bay fuse box. Here is the battery connector, the positive battery terminal. This guy right here goes to the airflow meter. Uh, silver top 20 valve engines have an airflow meter. The black top, uh, 20 valve engine has a mass airflow sensor. The uh, 20 valve airflow meter is kind of an expensive thing to find, but there is an alternative. I believe it's a Camry four cylinder. Uh, it has all the same connections, all the same uh, sensors inside. It plugs, it's a direct plug and play fit to this connector. It has the same diameter. Uh, inlet and outlet. 
This guy goes to the starter, both of these connectors here. This is the uh, O2 sensor connector. Um, here is my O2 sensor. It's usually recommended you get a real Toyota one because they cost a lot more, but they actually do a better job. Everything downstream of that on the harness is actually through the firewall, through this grommet. It's uh, in the cargo space um, in the trunk. Uh, and so everything in here is gonna be like the relays uh, and the ECU. You're gonna connect to your ECU in the trunk. If you're going to remove the engine using a hoist, you would jack up the front of the car and put jack stands under the forward jack points. Lift it up, the front end up, pretty much as high as you can, as high as your jack stands will go. Get some beefy jack stands for that, uh, just for the stability. It's not heavy, it just needs the stability. Um, and then you can lift the rear of the car with an engine hoist from the uh, rear bumper hooks. Just tilt the whole car up and ride off of the engine. If you have a scissor lift or a post lift, you can remove the engine just using the lift. With the scissor lift, the only have to, thing you have to be aware of is make sure when you put the car on the lift that the lift platform right here, the edge of the platform is ahead of the edge of the engine bay so that you have enough clearance. To do an engine swap in the MR2, the axles need to come out. Uh, it's really just as easy, if not easier, to remove the entire rear suspension carrier assemblies. There's like four bolts per carrier. There's a couple of bolts on the hub assembly, and then there's the trailing arm bolt and then you just pop the axles. You can disassemble them like I did or you can just pop them out of the transmission. With all this stuff out of the way, it opens the engine bay up quite a bit. You've got a lot more room to work with, a lot of clearance to get the engine out of the bay. All right, let's take a look at the output shafts and the axles on the AW11. This is true of the naturally aspirated models. It is not true of the supercharged models. Uh, the output shafts have three corners uh, this is true on both sides. There's, I mean, I'm gonna call them corners. It's not really a triangle, it's like a hex. But basically, there's three points. Uh, on each of these points, you'll see two studs, and you may or may not see a pin. Uh, this one, you'll notice, does not have a pin. These other two do have this pin. Turns out, those pins are very important. If you look at the axle, uh, where it mounts to that output shaft, you'll see a similar hole pattern. If you look at the bottom, it looks like you've got nine holes. But if you look more closely, you'll notice, hmm, one of those is not a hole. This guy right here is a decoy. There's a hole on the uh, cover plate, but there's not a hole that goes through the flange. A problem occurs if you try to mate the axle to the output shaft without aligning the two pins and if you put the one that has the decoy over one of the pins what will happen is it'll let you tighten those bolts down and you'll think you're home free but what's happened is it will just push this pin through then what happens is you only have one of these pins holding supporting the torque of the axle it's in conjunction with all these studs, and you would think that that would be enough, but actually those studs are weak. They will shear off. It's happened to me in races, and I've seen a lot of cars like buddies stop by, and we look at their axles, and they're starting to lose their studs on their axle output shafts. So, just be sure when you're assembling this, mark the blank and align it with the flange on the axle that only has the two holes and then you're home free. So the engine's in and I couldn't be happier. Very noticeable increase in power and performance. Thank you.
fix? That's a pretty good question. Uh, it's a nice improvement, but unless you had a dead engine that needed more than just a head gasket to get it running right, I don't think I would go to the trouble of swapping it out. So was the 20 valve the right choice? I do think 20 valve is excellent choice for swapping into these cars just because they are so compatible. The amount of work you have to do to get everything working in stock form, like your gauge cluster and all that. The transmission bolts up, everything goes pretty smoothly. And there's a lot of really good documentation and support on the swap. So it's an easy way to get quite a bit more power. Compared to the supercharged engine, I don't know, it would be tough to pick a favorite out of those two engines. The supercharged engine has a lot of torque all through the RPM range. I see a lot of people put V6s into these cars uh, or much larger four-cylinder engines. I think that's kind of missing the point of an AW11. AW11 is two things. It is handling and it is power to weight. Dropping a bigger engine into the back of an AW11 is going to upset the balance. If power is what you're all about, I think you should be looking at a different car than an AW11. My brother's AW11 race car had a 2ZZ swap. The 2ZZ is a 1.8 liter all aluminum variable valve timing. It makes about 180 horsepower and it is lighter than the 4AGE. That race car was just a riot. I loved driving that car. I think that engine would be fabulous in a street car. It's gonna be more work to get one swapped into an AW11 than just another variety of the 4AGE. If I had to pick the perfect engine for this car, it would be the 2ZZ. Let me know if there's any questions or things you would like me to follow up on right now. It's time to go drive this car.